Good afternoon, everyone. So we're all pretty familiar with the situation. We heard Dr. Tim Schilling speak about this at symposiums past, as well as Dr. Aaron Davis. And a lot of our speakers this morning have referenced what is really a dire situation for coffee farmers as the volume of production goes down, cost of inputs go up. There's this compelling draw from the farm to urban centers for what could be the next generation of coffee farmers. And so much of this um, is not only impacted and exacerbated by changing geopolitical dynamics, changing uh, economic dynamics, but of course changes that are influenced by climate change and challenges that are associated with a changing climate. So we're supposed to get your attention because there is a problem, and I think we're all very aware of this problem. And all of us in this room are addressing challenges associated with climate change in a couple of different ways. We can work together as an industry and as individuals to help abate the impacts uh, and the, the, the momentum of climate change by walking to work or having fuel-efficient vehicles, thinking about ways to reduce roaster emissions and zero CO2 footprint in our roasting operations and in our work environments. And we can also, as an industry, look at a way and try to find ways to make the coffee population more resilient and more robust, if you will, in the face of a changing climate. And all of those situations and those continuing pressures that we know are associated with a changing climate, like La Roya, uh, just to name one, frequent incidents of pests and other diseases that are really beginning to have a really significant challenge on coffee growing communities. So address, to address the situation, World Coffee Research is really focusing on, on the former. We're really looking for ways to understand the genetic variability and the genetic diversity of what we would call our global Arabica population. And this is the population of Arabica coffee that is in coffee farms and coffee estates around the world. There are also those wonderful little sort of demonstration trees that are in coffee gardens and research institutions around the world. And there's about 870 of them. And these 870 different kinds of Kefia Arabica really represent, if you will, sort of the, the basket of genetic material that we have at our disposal to find ways to make Kefi Arabica more resilient, more robust, more equipped to confront this situation of a changing climate and its associated pressures. So what do we know about this 870 different kinds of Kefi Arabica? We've kind of had a suspicion that although there's sounds like a lot of them, 870, um, we kind of have had the suspicion that there isn't a lot of variability or diversity within those 870 different strains of Arabica. And World Coffee Research has recently concluded a very comprehensive and very rigorous study that more or less confirms some of our worst fears, that of that 870 different kinds of Arabica, they are nearly identical, about 98% genetically identical, 2% variability. It, it's like, it's, it's, we kind of thought it was bad, but we didn't know it was quite that bad until the data proved it. So what do we do in the situation where we seem to have this huge array of Arabica, right? We know that it tastes different depending upon where it's grown and how it's grown, but we don't know that it's different enough to, as a species, really endure and really survive the pressures of a changing climate. So what do you do in this situation? Well, if you're World Coffee Research, if you're Senate Cafe, if you're other organizations that are really interested in plant breeding, you get busy and you think about how to breed the next generation of Café Arabica or coffee varietals that have the characteristics that can help to ensure all the things that we're looking for, like high yield, pest resistance, climate resiliency, as well as high quality. And the good news, and there is some good news, there's actually quite a lot of good news, and the good news is that World Coffee Research and other organizations like ours are actively working to breed this next generation of coffee to help better equip coffee farmers around the world to ensure that they can continue to gain a livelihood in coffee as well as inspire generations of coffee lovers. But if you're like me, you're thinking, now, I get the 
climate resilient part, I get the disease resistant part, I get the high yielding part, but this quality that you're talking about, these are varietals that I fell in love with as a young barista. I won't even tell you how many years ago, but these are the varietals that I know and love and that I've formed my passion for coffee around. What business does World Coffee Research or any other organization have going around messing with my beloved varietals to enhance them, enhance quality, and quality by whose standard and measured by what instruments, measured how, and then communicated how in what kind of way that would convince me as a coffee lover that the genetic research and the plant breeding is in good hands and that we're in good hands as coffee lovers, coffee farmers, coffee consumers, and people who get really excited about this thing called coffee. So we do know that to improve something, we have to measure it. We've been hearing a lot about data today, the importance of data and understanding our position as an industry in the market. Um, Daniele referenced the significance of data when we talk about how we're actually impacting coffee farmers. We heard Pierre talk about the data that has helped to inform um, how to help coffee farmers generate more income, not just through producing coffee, but also things like um, fish farming and animal husbandry and, and beekeeping. So we're, we're getting much more, I'd say, rigorous and uh, disciplined around making database decisions. And that's really the root um, purpose behind the work that World Coffee Research has been conducting over the last couple of years to understand how severe the problem is and then what can we do specifically to help address it. And when we're talking about quality, we're talking about how quality is measured and how we can ensure ourselves that as we think about ways to breed the next generation of coffee, that we're breeding in the desirable traits that we all know and love while breeding out those traits that act could actually compromise the quality of this thing that we hold so dear. So when we think about standardization, when we think about using common terms of reference, common metrics, when we think about being disciplined about how we measure and articulate the need to do our work and our approach to work, I like to think about color. So color has been more or less standardized into three primary colors that we're all more or less familiar with, red, yellow, and blue. And you can use these primary colors to describe a whole array of different things, like the redness of a cherry, for example, or the yellowness of a lemon, or the blueness of a blueberry. But how do we collectively agree on redness, yellowness, and blueness? By what standard do we measure them? Of course, there's lots of different blues that can be used to describe the blueness of a blueberry. And as a matter of fact, when I was preparing for this presentation, I googled blueberry, color of, and got three different references, if you will. So how do we standardize ourselves? How do we identify and agree on the right blue to describe blueberry? Well, the color industry is actually a little bit ahead of us on this. And some of you might be familiar with the Pantone measuring system or the PMS system. And this was a methodology for describing and then categorizing and cataloging a whole array of different colors. So regardless of where you were producing the color and for what application, whether it be branding, whether it be marketing, whether it be a new seasonal color sensation, you could use a common frame of reference do the Pantone color matching system to agree on that particular color. So again, working with the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue, the system was really revolutionary in that regardless of whether you were a colorist, colorologist in uh, Bangladesh or Malaysia or California or uh, Boston, you could all agree that there's a particular Pantone color reference that can be used as the standard for the color that you're talking about. So the Pantone color method has really taken off, and it's um, this idea of standardization has been adopted not only by marketing companies and people who are interested in branding, the fashion industry, folks that 
try to present flashy material to get consumers interested. It's also been adopted by governments and military organizations to standardize, for example, the color of a flag. So in 2003, the, the uh, Scottish Parliament sat down and said, hey, we need to standardize the color of the Scottish flag. We're tired of going around to different places in Scotland, different places around the world, and seeing this array of different blues on the Scottish flag. So for once in an all, let's define what Scottish flag blue is. So they used the Pantone system, and forevermore, the Pantone color for the blue of the Scottish flag is PE512. Okay, so if y'all are wondering how I make my special Scottish flag, you use PE 512. So if you're a Scottish super fan and you want to be absolutely certain that you're nailing that blue of the Scottish flag, you just whip out your Pantone PE 512 reference and you're good to go. So how do we do this? How do we apply a similar technology or a similar discipline in the work of describing the things that we love about coffee, aroma and flavor? How do we standardize and really commit to a common terminology and a common methodology to help us truly ensure that we are speaking in the same language? How do we describe that cherryness in a coffee or the citrusy notes in a coffee or the blueberry notes in a coffee? Well, our industry has actually been hard at work at this for many years. So back in 1984, uh, Ted Lingle developed the Cupper's Handbook. It's now in its fourth edition, and it really was our industry's very first point of common reference to standardize the terms and the terminology we were using to describe things that are important about coffee quality, aroma, body, mouthfeel, acidity, as well as descriptions for a number of different defects. So there's about 180 different terms in the Coffee Cupper's Handbook, and it's derived from about eight different sources. And it's a reference that I know I use regularly, and I'm sure many of you do too, to just get our heads around that, just that missing descriptive link that we're seeking when we're trying to describe what's important about coffee's smell and flavor. Then came the wine wheel, and we have Ann Noble of UC Davis to thank for the creation of this very elegant way of organizing different ways of describing what we would call the primary aromatic and flavor attributes associated with wine. So back in 1984, Anne rolled up her sleeves and said, how can we express these wonderful descriptions in a way that will create and foster a common way of communicating about what we love and appreciate about wine? Again, thinking about primary flavors and aromas and then building outward on the wheel from there. So, like any industry that's innovative, we stole a lot of information from, the, uh, from Ann Noble's wheel, and we created in 1985 the Coffee Taster's Flavor Wheel. Again, thinking about in terms of primary color, what are the primary flavors, what are the primary aromas that can influence our appreciation for coffee? So, in the case of the aroma and flavor wheel, it's, can you name them? dry distillation, sugar browning, and enzymatic, right? And it builds from there. Wonderful tools in describing the what we're tasting and for beginning to help us articulate some sort of common language about the what. So the idea of the wheel is totally taken off. Um, what began as a wine wheel, and that we now have a coffee wheel, we have a cheese wheel, we have a beer wheel, we have a honey wheel, we have a chocolate wheel, and yes, my friends, the much anticipated cannabis wheel. <laughs> and my teenage son said, no, 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 mom, you can't call it the cannabis wheel, it's the weed wheel. Okay, so we have, we have the weed wheel, and that's great, so if you're looking for ways to quantify the wonderful things that you're experiencing in a whole array of different consumables, the wheel can help you get there especially in describing the what. So what about the how much? So if we have a wheel to help us understand the what that we're tasting, the coffee cupper form, another wonderful product of the SCAA enhanced by CQI, helps us to quantify and describe the how much. Again, of those key attributes that we know and love of body, aroma, flavor, and uh, intensity of acidity, and the whole host of attributes that comprise coffee flavor and aroma. So we have a way to quantify the intensity 
or the how much of aroma and body and flavor in, with the help of the uh, coffee cupper form, but how do we harmonize the what and the how much. So we've all been in a situation where a whole panel of cuppers will give a coffee in 86, um, and we're all aligned to maybe a half a point or two to this 86, but we all have described what we love about that coffee to make an 86 a little bit differently. One person's Meyer lemon is another person's pomegranate, which is another person's passion fruit. We as cuppers don't do a great job aligning specifically on the what that we're tasting. So, enter the work of the Coffee Cuppers Lexicon and the work that WCR has been doing, teaming up with the wonderful people from Kansas State University, Gil Seville, who you met last year, to really get down to the key core attributes that really describe the what of the coffee and, as importantly, the how much of what we're describing as the what. So what's unique about this lexicon is that it not only helps us to identify about 108 key attributes that help us understand and describe coffee flavor and aroma, it also comes with some other very important components. 108 terms that are uniquely associated with a unique way of describing an aroma or a flavor, comes with descriptions for those terms, how we describe and standardize the use of that term. And most excitingly for me, and it's really fun to get excited about lexicons, most exciting for me is it comes with references. And these references are standards that can be reproduced with commonly available ingredients to ensure that we are absolutely aligned on a particular repeatable and scalable reference. And it also comes with a methodology for how to prepare that reference. So in the context of blueberry, you're tasting blueberry in your coffee and you're smelling blueberry in your coffee. It's like, yes, there's blueberry there and yes, I can taste it, but how much blueberry am I tasting? What's the level of intensity of that blueberry that I'm smelling? So that's sort of the important work behind not only identifying the what, but quantifying the how much of what it is that we're tasting. So in the world of the sensory lexicon for the description blueberry, there is a reference and the lexicon will tell you how to create and use that reference. It says, go buy a can of Oregon brand blueberries, commonly available in many grocery stores around the world, or at least in North America. Decant some of the liquid from that can of blueberries, and then take some of those blueberries out and put them in a little dish. And to understand the quality of the blueberry aroma, smell some of that liquid. And the liquid that you're smelling is a 6.0, on the, on the aromatic intensity scale, and then taste some of those blueberries, and according to the lexicon, the flavor of those blueberries has a blueberry intensity of 6.5. So we have a clear standard for the what? Oregon canned blueberries. We have a clear standard for the how much of the aroma, 6.0, and a clear standard for the taste of those blueberries, 6.5. And each 108 descriptive components in this lexicon has a similar point of reference, a similar methodology for preparing and tasting and smelling and aligning ourselves and calibrating on that point of reference. Great. That's very, really, really helpful because I live in Vermont, and I think that we produce some pretty fine blueberries in Vermont, maybe even better than those silly canned blueberries from down the road in Oregon. But the point is, it doesn't really matter if I prefer Vermont blueberries, Maine blueberries, Washington State blueberries, or Oregon blueberries. What matters is that we have a common point of reference that we can all gather around and align our perception and articulation of blueberryness around. So fantastic that we have this tool that helps us to get aligned around these particular references. So who are these people anyway that designed this lexicon? Well, some of them are actually in the room. We have Dr. Edward Chambers from, Edgar Chambers from Kansas State University here with some of his colleagues. And although you might say, huh, a bunch of people in white lab coats 
do we have an issue with genetic variability with these people? <laughs> but these are the tasting machines. These are the, the finely tuned instruments that Tim Schilling has referenced in other presentations. These are the people that are the rock stars in the world of sensory analysis and sensory standardization, sensory science and codification. So what these folks did, our friends at Kansas State University, is they corralled over 100 different samples of coffee with the help of FCAA and some other stakeholders to cast a really wide net around what we're perceiving, what we're experiencing as coffee. They sat down and they tasted it through their tried and true methodology for developing these lexicons. And they've developed lexicons from everything from bacon to pomegranates and dog food and nail polish and hair products. They run the full gamut of um, depth and scope of their expertise in developing these lexicons, and they aligned on 108 primary attributes that describe coffee aroma and flavor. They not only arrived at the 108, what's really exciting about this, but two other independent labs also working to codify and standardize these things that we say coffee smells and tastes like, came up with more or less the same 108 references. So if this world-renowned team in Kansas, at Kansas State University, along with two other highly qualified teams, are identifying the same 100 or so key sensory attributes that help us to define coffee quality and what we love about coffee, then we know that the methodology works. But you may not know these people, how can we really trust them to uh, influence the development of the next generation of coffee varietals that we're supposed to fall in love with? Well, you may not know them, but you may know some of these people. So were they skeptical at first about <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of this lexicon? And hey, really, am I going to buy into all this science stuff? I mean, I've been cupping for years. What can you teach me about what I'm tasting? It's like, OK, fair enough. But after a few sessions of sniffing, <laughs> and smelling, and a little bit of a lot of tasting, it all actually began to make sense. You really understood that with the help of these references that you could both smell and taste, all that ambiguity about, gosh, is it really powerful blueberry that I'm smelling and tasting? Is it really lemon or is it something else that's citrusy? It all sort of began to fall into place. So lots of different references, lots of different opportunities to refine and, and validate this methodology. And you know, what does it all mean to us? What are we going to do with this enhanced lexicon? What's the next step? So we know that there's about 108 and more to come key attributes that are essential in the work of identifying, selecting, and then replicating those attributes that we love about coffee. And each of those attributes has sort of a trail back to the DNA, the genetic material of the coffee that, that generated it? And how do we optimize our knowledge of the linkages between what we're tasting and smelling and the genetic material that produced it? So that's the work that's ahead of us. So, so what do we do with this information? Do we literally reinvent the wheel? Uh, no, because uh, someone's already done that. But <laughs> we can also, <laughs> thank you, Tim. So we're not going to reinvent the wheel. And that's not necessarily what our purpose is. Because we don't really think that this lexicon is going to be the thing that you turn to when you sit down and evaluate the coffee that you're considering to buy. The lexicon that we're going to turn to as an industry and interested plant breeders to ensure that we're breeding in the characteristics that will really make coffee continue to taste special. Perhaps the information could be displayed in a spider graph that not only identifies the particular attributes, but the intensity of those attributes. Or something perhaps a little bit more visually interesting, like something that creates an association between the different types of aromas and flavors that we're tasting. But whatever the outcome and whatever form this material takes, really the purpose behind it is to ensure that plant breeders, coffee farmers, people who love coffee and who are really motivated to help ensure that it improves and endures are selecting the right material to create the next generation of coffee varietals that will continue to excite the current and next generation of coffee lovers while ensuring that this and next generation of coffee growers can stay in the game. Thank you. <laughs>